Good morning, viewers. Hope you all are safe and healthy at your homes. I welcome you once again to the second episode of Meet the Media Veteran series. Today in the series, we have with us an award-winning filmmaker, international entrepreneur, motivational speaker, and author, Dr. Bhuvan Lal. Let me formally welcome Dr. Bhuvan Lal on the show. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Lal, for joining us today. Pleasure. Absolute privilege. Absolute privilege. Uh, before formally starting the show, let me uh, first introduce uh, Mr. Lal to all the audience. As I briefed earlier, Dr. Bhuvan Lal is an award-winning filmmaker, international entrepreneur, motivational speaker, and author from Delhi. In a career spanning 30 years over three continents, Dr. Lal has enjoyed a wide range of top-level decision-making exposure risk-taking experience in the creative and corporate areas of entertainment business. Dr. Lal has produced two artistically acclaimed feature films, 35 documentary films, 25 world-class events, including the multi-billion dollar India Splendor 2007 in Los Angeles, and an international TV series, Chance of a Lifetime. In addition, Dr. Lal has held leadership positions as the president of a multi-billion dollar Indian conglomerate in Beverly Hills, California, USA for six years. And as the executive director of Indian Broadcasting Foundation, he established the largest trade body in the Indian media sector. He was senior vice president of a TV network, member of the board of directors of entertainment companies, and operated a wide media consultant, consulting firm advising the top names in Hollywood, Europe, and India. He is the author of two very famous books, The Man India Missed the Most, Subhash Chandra Bose, and The Great Indian Genius, Hardayal. Dr. Lal is also a popular motivational speaker who offers inspirational talks about leadership and heroism to select audiences speaking about the heroes of Indian freedom movement from Lala Hardayal to Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. He has lectured at universities worldwide, including UCLA, UCR, and USD. He has graduated from MCRC Jamia Millia Islamia, and he, has, he also has an advanced uh, course in entertainment studies from UCLA. I welcome you back, uh, Dr. Lal, to this show. And uh, today, Dr. Lal would be speaking on a very interesting topic, The World is Not Enough, The History and Future of Indian Cinema at International Film Festivals. We know cinema is the most powerful art form, but are the most of the Indians understand cinema as an entertainment medium only, but it is much more than that actually. It has a universal language. We exchange cultures through cinema. We understand various cultures through cinema. So cinema just cannot be our national heritage. It is in fact an international heritage. And in this context, it is important to understand the history and future of Indian cinema at international film festivals. Very shortly, Dr. Bhuvan Lal is going to deliberate on this topic. I'm sure all of you enjoy it because enjoy this topic. Nobody, in my knowledge, has attempted this topic in, in a talk format in, in this Indian subcontinent. So I'm sure this is going to be a very, very interesting talk. And uh, Dr. Lal, who himself is a filmmaker and frequent visitor to all prestigious film festivals of, all across the globe, I think he's going to give you, you know, very, very important information on this topic. So before inviting Dr. Lal to deliver the talk, I would advise all the viewers to write their questions in the comment section, and all the questions will be taken up at the end of the show. May I now request Dr. Lal to kindly deliver the talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rizwan Bhai. Thank you very much. Uh, you have been so kind to invite me. I really appreciate this gesture and the fact that I've got this opportunity to speak about a subject that I've been involved in for a very long time. Absolutely. I've spent almost 40 years attending film festivals. But the business of film festivals, as you rightly said, is a global subject. And India has had a role in international film festivals for a very long time, much, much longer than any other country. The reason being, we created a unique language in cinema. The Indian civilization brought a completely new style of filmmaking to the world of cinema. But 
before we discuss all that, I'll just quickly tell you how the film business works, what is the role of a film festival, and where did it all start? Every business around the world has opportunities to present the best of its creation at some trade show or some event. For the automotive industry, there is the Geneva car show. You bring your latest cars and you show them there. Similarly, in America, you have the Detroit Motor Show. In the aviation business, you have the Paris Air Show and Farnbro, where you show the latest planes. So the film industry being unique to itself, you know, also created a trade show and a place where you could bring the best of what you had made. This became an international festival and it actually had a competitive element to it. So you could select a set of movies and then make them present, uh, present them in a cinema and then select from them through a jury which film is the best. The Italians were the first to do this at the Venice Film Festival. This is before the Second World War. And surprisingly, the French thought that their film will win the best prize, but because it was politically motivated and the ruler of Italy at that time, Mussolini, wanted his own filmmakers to win the award, he ensured that the Venice Film Festival gave the top prize to the Italian film. This enraged the French. They did not believe that was fair and they started their own film festival. So to counter the Venice Film Festival, they started a film festival in south of France in Cannes. Then Second World War happened. So they had to wait till the Second World War ended. And in 1946, the Cannes Film Festival took off. You will be very happy to know that in the first film festival of its type in France, in Cannes, one of the winners was an Indian film called Nichanagar. It was made by Chetan Anand. It was very difficult at that time to understand global cinema. It was extremely difficult to present a film outside India. There were a lot of restrictions. There were a lot of foreign exchange problems. Yet Chetan Anand managed to get his film to Khan, got selected and won a prize. And he went there to accept the prize. When the news of his film having won an award in Khan went across India, Every filmmaker of consequence wanted to make a film that would win an international award. Among them was a young budding filmmaker who wanted just to make his first film. He lived in Calcutta and his name was Satyajit Rai. He talked to Chetan Anand and Chetan Anand gave him a lot of inspiration about how to make the films that could win international awards and be seen globally. Many years later, Satyajit Rai made a film called Pathar Panchari. That was his first film. He made it with his own savings and a little bit of support from the government. These were very difficult times for filmmakers. You couldn't just walk into a room and collect money and make films. But he managed to make it. The film was artistically appreciated by everybody in Calcutta, by everybody in India. And also there was a possibility of the film being sent overseas. But all of this required money and support from the government. The government at that time was smart enough to understand that this film could go to Khan. And they sent Satyajit Rai's film, Pathar Panchali, to Khan. When it was shown at Khan, it was screened at a time where the audience was not interested. So there were very few people who saw it. But when they came out of the cinema, they were so impressed. They suggested to the festival director that the film should be shown again. These things are not done normally. Film is shown only once. But because it didn't get that kind of an audience that it should have got, the film was screened again. It was loved by the audiences in Cannes. And a special award for the best human document was created just to honor this particular film. With that film, Satyajit Rai arrived on world stage. He was not in Khan to accept the honor, but this was announced and it became a global phenomena that a filmmaker from India was recognized in Khan. Other than Satyajit Rai, we had other filmmakers in the 50s who were regularly going there and presenting their films. There were films made by Bimal Roy, which were appreciated. There were 
There's a film by Harbans Khanna, which was appreciated. But none of them won the kind of acclaim that Satyajit Rai's film won. Bimal Rai's film also, also did very well. Though because I mean, but not at the level of Satyajit Rai. In any case, the language of cinema from India was appreciated. And we started making more films that started going globally. Now, what does a film festival do for a filmmaker? One, it gives you global exposure. The language you are speaking is also being spoken by others in different ways. The use of sound, the use of techniques, the use of performances, where you splice your film, where you place your camera is understood by a global audience and appreciated. And how you tell a story, in what format you tell a story, what are the transitions you use between scenes. These are all the nuances that come through when you watch a film in a festival with other filmmakers. So for a filmmaker, it's actually a fantastic platform, not only to get appreciated for the work that they do, but also for the work in, of others and understanding the languages being spoken, the cinematic idioms being used, and the style of cinema that is evolving around the world. The other thing that a good filmmaker or a, a filmmaker who has made a film, has gone to a festival, can do is meet distributors and exhibitors. Globally, the business of cinema is huge. A prize at a film festival means that you get global recognition. A film like Parasite last year won the top prize in Cannes. It became a rage across the world. And eventually, it swept the Oscars. It's a rare combination to win the top prize in Cannes and then win the top prize at the Oscars. I think Parasite is a unique film by that standard. And they actually created a global platform for that film. And now everybody around the world appreciates Parasite. So I'm using the example of Cannes because in the festival business, we have about half a dozen world-class festivals. Cannes is one. Venice, of course, as I told you, was the one that started it all in Italy. So Venice and Cannes. Carlo Vivari has been a festival for a very long time. It's also considered a very important festival. Locarno in Switzerland is considered a very important festival. Berlin Festival is a festival where India has always made a mark. And in North America, there are two major festivals which are outstanding. One is Sundance, started by Robert Redford, and the other is Toronto. The third festival in America, started by Robert De Niro, is Tribeca. These three festivals are considered world-class. A lot of films come from the rest of the world, especially to Toronto, which is now actually probably the second best festival in the world, according to me, after Cannes. In Asia, we have, of course, the International Film Festival of India, which is held every year in Goa. I've been going there since 2004, and I've attended many editions before that in Delhi. It's, it's, it's a unique festival by its own standard, and it has provided a platform to a lot of young filmmakers from India to present their work over many, many years. And there is a festival in Busan in Korea, which is a global standard festival. Three things happen at the festival, as I was telling you. Number one, you get an opportunity to show your film. Two, you get to meet a lot of people who are in the business of film. Now, the business of film is a multi-billion dollar film around the world. And with the coming of Netflix, OTT platforms, you get access to markets. Your film can go global. You will get audiences around the world. So how would you do that by uh, you know, uh, just staying at home? You just have to get on a plane, get to a festival, show your film, get people interested to acquire it. This this process is very important for a filmmaker to get his product out there. And the third thing that you do, it's a learning exercise. Cinema is evolving continuously. It's globally, people are making films. Now, with the ease of film equipment and the ease of cost of making films, a lot of product is coming out. So you get to see and learn from other filmmakers. That's the third thing you do in a film festival. So every year, one should invest in at least attending one major festival if you want to go attend a film festival of global standard, you can go easily to many festivals within India itself. There is, of course, the Goa International Film Festival of India. There are festivals held in all major cities now. Calcutta Film Festival, Kolkata Film Festival is well known. The one in Kerala is very well known. The one in Bangalore is coming up. 
and there are other places. So just to get there and understand how films are shown, who's there, who are the filmmakers who have come, what can we learn from them, attend their press conferences, have one-on-one -on -one conversations if possible with them, learn the techniques of cinema. It's, it's, a, it's a fabulous exercise. When I was um, in the film school back in Jamia in the 80s, one of our professors, he challenged us. He said, there's a film festival in Delhi happening right now. It's there for 10 days. I want each one of you to see at least 50 films, which meant seeing five films a day. And we did it from morning 8.30 till late night, 12 o'clock. Every day we would be running between cinemas and watching films and seeing as many films we could and making notes. And this is an education by itself. So it's very important to do this. In the last 25 years, I've attended almost all the festivals around the world. I've been invited to so many of them. And some I've been on jury also. So I've seen films and met filmmakers of all kinds. I'd like to tell you three incidents in my visiting the film festivals, which are unique. And they will stay with me forever. Last year, I met for the second or the third time, uh, Quentin Tarantino. Quentin Tarantino has always amazed me with his cinema. He is one of those, you know, unique American filmmakers, actually an extraordinary American filmmaker who can combine the aesthetics of cinema and tell a story with commercial television, commercial film stars and sell it widely. All his films have cinematic depth as well as a commercial viability. This interests me a lot. So I spent a lot of time with him last year just discussing how he builds stars, how he tells the story, how he goes about it, what excites him in a scene, how, how he views various actors, what does he pull out of a you know, script, what he does not uh, show on screen, what he avoids totally. And in that conversation, Indian cinema came up. Excitedly, he told me among the first films he saw was Shole. And he went on to praise Shole to the sky. He said, I loved Shole. And it was one of those films which was something which I couldn't have done. And one scene that remained with him was the scene in which Hema Malini is dancing in pieces of glass. He said, I don't know how Indian cinema does that because I can't make it and sell it to American audience. Nobody will believe that somebody can dance on glass. And it's so difficult. But in Shole, it's so believable. And the director did it. And I had a unique experience since related to this. Uh, last year in Goa, I met Ramesh Shippi, the man who made Shole, and I narrated the same story to him. And he obviously is a very modest man after such an accomplished career. And he accepted the compliment from uh, Quentin Tarantino. So Indian cinema in its own language, own way from Raj Kapoor to Satyajit Rai the back then and now with the coming of Anurag Kashyap and the other kind of filmmaking that has come has made a mark globally. People know these names. People appreciate their language of cinema. They want to watch more and more of these works. And we are coming to a point where Indian filmmakers will not only be able to break through the small markets around the world, they will make a big name for themselves globally. That's why I wanted this talk to be titled, The World Is Not Enough. Because we are now getting to a stage with OTT platforms. Whenever you make a film now and you sell it to, say, a Netflix or Amazon or anybody else in this business, anyone on earth can see it. And then they can give their comments. And it can become a global subject or a global talk. A, a viral, uh, you know, uh, the reviews can go viral. So it, we will have a completely new set of audiences for the future filmmakers. Audiences that didn't exist earlier because the films didn't go to those countries or didn't have those markets within the scope of Indian distributors. This is an unbelievable opportunity to tell your stories. The world out there wants to hear stories they've not heard before. In that, the language has to be unique. By unique, I'm saying it has to be original. I would love you to watch filmmaker's work, an Indian filmmaker's work who lives in America, in Canada. His name is Tarsem. Tarsem Singh 
went from India to study for an MBA in America. His father was an engineer in Indian Airlines. He had very little money, but he managed to send his son to America to study for engineering or for MBA. While he was doing his MBA, he learned that there was a course in filmmaking over there. So he switched from MBA to filmmaking. Tarsem Singh's father was so upset that he said, I invested my money in you to do an MBA and now you're studying cinema. Nobody knows where this will take you. Tarsem Singh started working in a small restaurant as a, in uh, Los Angeles as a bearer. And as a waiter, he would collect money and then pay for his fees. A stage came when he made a small film, which was a rock video. And the rock video was in the lab and the lab refused to release the video because there was no money from the person who had made it. So the same came back to the restaurant and told his friends that, look, I've made this rock video. It's very nice, but I can't show it to anybody because this lab will not release it till I pay them. So all the waiters in the restaurant collected their savings and put together $5,000 for Tarsem Singh to get that video out of the lab. And when he released that video that year, it went for competition and the MTV awards, it won the best video of the year awards. Overnight, the same thing had arrived in Hollywood. He has made about 10 odd films. You can see them whenever you want and you will see his language of cinema is so unique that no filmmaker anywhere in the world has ever made films like the same thing. And he has worked with Julia Roberts. He's worked with all the top Hollywood talent, Ben Kingsley. He has made films that have earned over $100 million. He is a unique talent, absolutely gifted filmmaker. And he can't, you know, go around the world praising himself, talk about his cinema. He lives a very, very artistic life. Looks like a guy who is uh, somewhere in the 16th century who is married to cinema. Los Angeles is a very big town. It's, 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 it's 10 times the size of Bombay and Delhi. And you need a car to go everywhere. But Tarsem Singh, even though he has the most expensive cars in the world in his garage, came to see me in a cycle. He's just lost in his own world. He lives in his own universe. And all he discusses with you over coffee or tea is cinema. That is the kind of talent that you will get to see when you step out of India. And this man now is making other films, TV shows and stuff around the world. He's represented by the top agents in America and he gets a lot of work. And his films will do very well as we go along and you will hear more of him. The other filmmakers that have impressed me by making films that have stepped out of the comfort zone. There's a filmmaker in Bombay called Ketan Mehta. Ketan Mehta made a film called Mirch Masala. Please watch that film. I think it's probably one of the best films India has ever produced. It was made at a very low cost in a very difficult environment with uh, all kinds of issues facing the filmmaker. But he managed to make a film which cuts through. Even now, if you show it in a Western audience or a global audience, they love it. Not only are the performances and uh, the uh, visuals totally Indian and very sort of uh, uh, exotic for a Western audience. The way he has told the story, this language he's using, the style of uh, communication that is coming through is all award winning. I'm because uh, India was what it was when this film was made, it didn't get the credits it should have. In today's world, a film like Mirch Masala would be loved by everyone. In fact, Sanjalila Bansali told me that was the best film he had ever seen. So there you are. And in Padma Wat, you see shades of uh, you know Mirch Masala being. Uh, uh, once you watch Padma Wat and you have watched Mirch Masala, you will understand what I'm talking. It it was inspired sort of by Mirch Masala. So we have also got upcoming filmmakers in India who are making films as we speak. And these films are yet to be seen. They are all unique. They are all in their own way, speaking a language 
which has not been seen around the world. And I have been interacting with some of these filmmakers in Goa when they come there with their first films. And I see the passion in them. And I think we are heading in the right direction. You will have at least five to 10 Indian filmmakers who will make this country very proud with awards at all the film festivals like Satyajit Rai, Minal Sen, Adur Gopal Krishnan, Shaji Karun, Ketan Mehta, Sham Benigal. All these people did in their own time. We will have the next crop of the next generation of filmmakers coming out very soon. And the OTT platforms will help them get a global audience. Well, coming back to the old story of Khan Film Festival. Khan, by its location, is a unique place. It's in south of France. The weather there is fantastic. It's, it's ideal in the summer. So for 10 days, you get an opportunity to watch 20 films that they have selected. And plus, they have sidebars of other films that they have selected, but 20 films which compete for the top prize in Cannes. The challenge for India is that the Palme d'Or, the top prize in Cannes, since the mid-50s, has never been won by an Indian. Even Satyajit Rai won the best document film. He did not win the prize, for, which is the highest ranking prize in Cannes, the Palme d'Or. Palm de Or has been given to filmmakers for almost 60 years, 60 plus years actually. And for the last 25 years, since 94, no Indian film has even been in the top 20 films selected by Khan for competition for that award. So that's the challenge India is facing. That's the challenge that we have to take on, head on, and make a film that breaks through and gets there. Indian filmmakers have to produce and direct and make a film as unique, as, as, as interesting, as, as substantive as Paradise. Oh, sorry, Parasite. And also work towards creating a global audience with such a film. That breakthrough film, I think, is around the corner. We, we, can, we can see hints of that in the work that we see on the OTT platforms regularly. People, people are getting there. They have, they have uh, invented a sort of Indian identity on the Netflix and the Amazon platforms. I believe Patal Lok is very good. I haven't seen it, but I'm told it's extremely good. I saw Kamyab. It was very good. And um, um, I'm actually the kind of person who prefers watching films in cinema conditions. I don't like television format or um, small screen format for films as my first choice. I prefer the big screen experience because that's cinema for me. But Whatever it is, people are making films for the OTT platforms and they are doing very well. So I see a lot of hope there and hopefully one of these will be in Khan. Shall we uh, open for some questions or if you want me to talk about something specific, Rizwan Bhai, I can go there. Uh, yeah, I, actually, if you could name, you know, some of the uh, best films from India, which have won, uh, you know, laurels in different film festivals all across the globe. Or even, you know, some films which have been to different, you know, popular festivals all across the globe. I think that would be good for the audience. Yeah. Actually, Anurag Kashyap's uh, films have done well recently. But before that, Mira Nair's films were uh, awarded around the world. We had um, a bunch of films from uh, Minal Sen, globally recognized. Sham Benegal's initial films were there in the film festivals. And Shaji Karun's film, Adur Gopal Krishnan's films. These are the filmmakers that have made... Um, Mark regularly. Uh, I think Devdas was shown in Khan, but not in competition. Sanjay Leela Bansali was there. Uh, other than that, uh, not much. We have uh, had Shekhar Kapoor make a few films, but not for the festivals, outside the festivals. Women filmmakers currently working now in Bombay are more exposed also to global cinema. Earlier onwards, they were they were more. I'll tell you something very interesting. There's an Indian filmmaker called Subhash Ghai. He makes pure Bombay style filmmakers, but he goes to Cannes and he's a very regular cinema watcher in Cannes. He goes and sees films which everybody else is seeing. And they are not like anything that India makes or anything we attempt or has absolutely the, you know, the end of the one end of the spectrum as far as his kind of cinema is concerned. So I keep asking him, why do you watch these films? Because they are not song and dance. They are so intense and the storytelling is different. It is 
the exposure which is important for a filmmaker. It's the inspiration you draw from other filmmakers that is important. And that's some, that is something that he does regularly as a filmmaker, even, even now, even though he's made 10, 15, 20 films as a producer, director and a writer and won awards and made a lot of money from. But he still likes to watch other voices. And that's something we should always encourage young filmmakers to do, to watch other voices, to learn from others. If you were a writer, you would read novels and other people's works. Similarly, as a filmmaker, you have to watch other people's works. So that's that. Anything else, sir, is one by? Yeah, I have a couple of questions before taking questions oh, of the sorry. audience. Sir. So uh, if he specifically talk about the cons, you write from Nicha Nagar or, you know, Pathir Panchali to, you know, Masan or, or maybe, you know, uh, Piravi of Shaji and Karun. You know, how do you see the story changing uh, for the Indian films at the Khan Film Festival especially? Because that is known as the Macau Film Festival. So I'm specifically talking about the Khan Film Festival. Uh, Rizwan Bhai, Khan Film Festival has had three, four stages as far as Indian cinema is concerned. Till the 80s, the domination of Indian films was pretty regular. Whatever Minal Sen made, whatever Satyajit Rai made, whatever... Adur made, they all went to Khan. In 1982, let me give you a specific example. Golden year for Indian cinema in Khan. Khan Film Festival paid homage to the top filmmakers on earth and they invited Satyajit Rai for the first time in Khan. He had invited earlier, but he never went. So he, he was invited. He went there in, on opening night. He picked up the prize that was given to him for being a global standard filmmaker recognized by Khan. And the other filmmakers were Antinoni and, you know, that, that, that league. They had invited 10 filmmakers and he was chosen among them. Minal Sen was on the jury that year. And with Gabriel Garcia Marquez as the jury president. Gautam Ghosh's film was in the festival along with Adur Gopal Krishnan's. So we had four top filmmakers of India walking around in Khan who were invited by Khan for film uh, which were selected in various stages and a jury member too. Now, that I think 1982 is a unique year. After that, we have had filmmakers going there once in a while. Now you see almost 500, 600 Indians every year go to Khan. True. 250 never come back. They just go for, you know, sort of visiting Khan. But the regular people who go there are film critics, all of them, and some filmmakers like Sudhir Mishra is a regular in Khan. I see him very often. He comes there, he talks to filmmakers, he watches a lot of films. He loves the Khan experience. And uh, uh, films have not made it to the top league of 20 films that Khan selects. But in the sidebars, in the juries, we have had a lot of Indians. Manto was shown, uh, I think, the year before. And um, uh, Nandita... Uh, did not know how to produce the film at that stage. He wa she wanted some money. So I encouraged her. I said, why don't you go to Khan and consider it a business expense and find a producer? Eventually, she did find a couple of producers and she made the film Manto. And interestingly, she had been on the jury of Khan and eventually the film was shown in Khan, though not in the competition. But the film was appreciated in Khan. Miss Lovely was shown in Khan. It was um, yeah, produced in India. So a lot of these films have gone. Another aspect of Khan is the publicity you get. All the magazines that write about cinema, almost 3,000 journalists are accredited with Khan. So if you go to Khan, your festival magazines, the daily journals that come out there, they will probably end up interviewing you as a filmmaker and get you a picture or a, you know, um, a publicity about what you do. I did that for Screen International and my wife was the correspondent for Variety. So we have uh, covered Indian cinema at a time when nobody wrote about Indian cinema. There was very little to write about. So every year in Khan, there would be about 20 Indians walking around and they, they were just figuring it out. And some were obviously veteran. There was Krishna Shah from Hollywood. There was Ashok Amrit Raj. They lived in America. They used to come to Khan. And a few other people I remember from back then. Of course, National Film Development Corporation, NFDC, they always had a presence in Khan for years. Uh, I used to meet them. But other than that, the Indian filmmaking really took off, uh, Indian, uh, the uh, Khan experience took off for Indians after the screening of Devdas, I think in 2002. 
when um, Sushma Suraj led the Indian delegation to Cannes and all the filmmakers from Mumbai and India, they went there to attend the festival. So from that day onwards, there's been a regular India pavilion. We spend a lot of money as a government to, you know, encourage people to come to the India film fair, India pavilion. We do panels over there. There's all kinds of networking events. A good exposure is done. I must tell you something very interesting. Yeah. There is a film market in Khan. There is a India pavilion in Khan, and there is the festival of Khan. A lot of filmmakers who don't get into the festival as a selected film in the festival advertise their films very often as screened in Khan. It means nothing. Anybody can pay to get a film screened in Khan, rent a cinema and show it there. It means nothing. There is no value attached to it. But I often see filmmakers promote their films as saying screen in Khan. And a couple of years ago, I saw billboards in Bombay of a film being released and they had written on it screened at the India Pavilion in Khan. It means absolutely nothing. <laughs> Anybody can go and even, you know, if you make a home video of your children playing in the park, you can show it at the India Pavilion. What does it take? Nothing. But <coughs> people use it as a publicity gimmick. The other thing we are missing out, the film festival of Khan is essentially a filmmaker's film festival. If you are in the business of films, you make films, you enjoy making films, you like films, you are in the uh, uh, person in the film trade, you will enjoy the festival. But for many people in India, the festival has now become who is walking on red carpet and what are they wearing? So it's become a fashion statement to, you know, it's fine for what it is. But that's not what the festival is about. In fact, two years ago, the festival has banned selfies on the red carpet because it was creating a traffic jam. Nobody would move. They would just get selfies after selfies and the movement on the entire red carpet was getting blocked. So they banned the selfies. I'll tell you an interesting anecdote. An Indian actress, I'll not name her, wanted to become popular in um, Indian movies. So she went to Khan and walked on the red carpet. Now, if you are a popular Western actor or an Indian actor of global importance, the photographers know you and the media frenzy completely overtakes your presence on the festival uh, red carpet and they keep shouting your name to get your picture. So if you look at them, and they keep shouting it, they get a good picture. So they try and frame you and they keep shouting. This particular actress, obviously nobody knew. So she walked the red carpet and nobody stopped her. Nobody called out her name. She completed those 100 yards and she realized it was a complete failure. So she walked back, which nobody does. And walked <laughs> all over again, slowly hoping that somebody will recognize her and she will get uh, some photographs or some frenzy around her. Nothing. I was observing it from the side and just being amused by the presence of this woman. The lady was really working hard. Then she did it for the third time, hoping that now <laughs> something will happen. By now, the Khan security guards realized something was amiss. Why was this woman walking the other way around when everybody was walking towards the cinema? And they pulled her out and they sent her inside. And of course, she met me there and I told her it was fine. And a lot of people saw you. You did a good job. This has become a routine for a lot of people just to attend the festival, walk the red carpet, not even go into the cinema, just walk out, you know, so that they can get publicity that they walk the red carpet at Khan. It's fine for what it is, but it also it means nothing. No career move. Nobody will care unless you make a film and you perform in that film in a way that it connects with people and they appreciate and then they want you in their movies. There is no point sauntering around the Khan business, you know. One last thing also, this one by connected to this, the business of partying in Khan. True. It's very important. There are about 100 odd parties in Khan in 10 days. All kinds. On boats, on yachts, in villas, in private residences, in, in uh, hotels, in restaurants. But there are only probably five parties which matter. Absolutely. So out of the 195 are meaningless. They are the same. You will go there, you will meet people who are useless, and you will just waste your time. Those five parties are impossible for a normal person to get into because you have to have access. 
if you walk there for the first time, chances are you won't even really know what those parties are. But they are important for getting to meet the right people. Now, Indian government some time back understood this. And for three or four years, the India party, which was held by the NFDC and a fabulous set of people who organized it, they understood this part of networking for Indian cinema. And they managed to throw some fabulous parties with Indian food and Indian music in Khan. And those three, four years, in fact, in the Indian party was considered the best party of the festival. And I have seen the amount of people who stood outside waiting in line, trying to get into those parties. The gate crashers, the people who wanted genuinely to come, it was impossible to manage. They have a security after security just to push people out so that the genuine people who had been given invites could come. And everybody of consequence who came to Khan for the festival was at those parties. So it's also a magnet which we should use as a, as a nation, as a government to get people to get attracted to our cinema. So that, that is, that is, that's also happened. Go ahead. So very nice anecdotes indeed. Uh, I remember meeting you at Khan's, uh, such a madness and such a well-organized festival it is, no doubt. But uh, suddenly the Indian filmmakers, you know, they need to be very focused. They need to expose them to the festivals in a very, very focused way to change the narrative actually. So, you know, shifting focus from the Khan Film Festival, uh, do you remember any, you know, breakthrough at Berlin or Venice, you know, when an Indian film made a buzz there? Yeah. Monsoon Wedding, which Meera and I are made at a very low cost in Delhi, with almost no money, but an interesting way of telling a story and an interesting subject, made a mark in Venice and it won the top prize there. And that also is a, is a festival worth attending. It has the madness of Khan. It has the madness of other festivals. You get to meet the same kind of filmmakers. And Venice, of course, is a beautiful place, as beautiful as it can get. But it's not held in Venice. It's held in Lido, next to Venice. So Mira Nair is another filmmaker who understands this. She was there in Cannes last year doing a workshop. And if you have made a film, and her first film, of course, Salam Bombay, was in Cannes and won the Camera Deor, which is the prize for a first-time filmmaker. That prize, I must tell you, has been won by Indians, I think, three or four times. Uh, Deepa yeah. Mehta, who is partly Indian uh, from uh, Canada, uh, won it for Sam and Me. Uh, Mira Nair won it. Um, Murli uh, made a film, I'm forgetting the name, a uh, beautiful film. It was the first film he made, and uh, that also won the Camera de Or. So the Camera de Or. Correct. Shaji Karun is the fourth yeah. filmmaker. You're absolutely right. So these are the guys. And Shaji has been coming to Khan now regularly as a, as a delegate and watching movies. So hopefully he, he will break through with his next, uh, you know, whatever he makes. Khan will appreciate it. Khan right. likes originality. All festivals like originality. You have to do something which other people are not doing and it's still working. One um, uh, additional anecdote I must add here is my experience of Khan over 25 years has been to meet a man called Derek Malcolm. Derek Malcolm has been watching Indian cinema from mid 60s onwards. He's about 85 now, I think, maybe more. Uh, and he, he knew Satyajit Rai personally. He knew all the filmmakers from back then till now. And he, he watches films all the time. So he's able to tell you or me or any filmmaker what is working or what is not and what is the current language. He's, he's not very happy with the current state of affairs in India, but he's hoping that he will see something interesting coming out. We, we have to, we have, um, there's a filmmaker called Anup Singh. I think Anup has a, has a chance. Anup sure. uh, makes very interesting film. He made a film with Irfan in which Irfan played a ghost. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's a very, very bizarre film in, in many respects, but I really liked it. because Anup also has this unique voice and a multi-layered approach to cinema. So that, that is what is important. And those are the filmmakers that are, they are going in the right direction. Uh, one last question from my side, then I'll take up the audience question. Uh, yeah. so, uh, it, it doesn't directly deal with the film festivals as such, uh, but everybody would like to, you know, uh, listen to the story behind it. Uh, Didi, why couldn't uh, Mother India won the Oscar actually? What went wrong actually? Nothing went wrong. 
you see the uh, the oscars is now becoming more um, sort of open to global uh, cinema the oscars is and i've lived in los angeles and i've you know, seen um, uh, how it works personally i've attended oscars also so i know the inside story oscars is a private club it is a club of 3 or 1000 people living in los angeles and new york and some in london who watch films and they award films now within that club there are various committees for various films so there is a committee specifically for voting for each category so the international film category is a category by itself and they watch films of a certain type and that from all over the world now 8900 films come every year in the international category earlier very few films went technically these people are not exposed to global cinema they like a certain kind of world view of um, the way things are around the world and the films from india that have gone over many many years have not even made it to the top 5 nomination because if you make a film which actually is very now it will change because there's a global approach to uh, oscars also if you make a film which doesn't agree with the american way or american viewpoint of india it's unlikely to cut ice over there those people in that club oscar club have a certain view of india mother india interestingly was shown in america and uh, mehboob saab went there and he took yusuf saab dilip kumar with him and there are very interesting anecdotes you know in one situation the film was being screened and the filmmaker who was watching it said something absurd about what was being shown on screen and mehboob saab got so upset that he shut the film and he said i don't want to show it to you so he wanted actually the film that he didn't make which would have been a fabulous film he wanted to make a film called taj mahal in hollywood and he spent a lot of time living there writing the script for making a film called taj mahal while he had gone to you know promote his film mother india and he almost hired elizabeth taylor to play the lead in that film It didn't happen and uh, he came back but um, th- that 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 is uh, hollywood for you it, it will not work on your rules uh, it will work on its own rules they don't have any space for making any accommodation to anything that you want to do they just do what they want to do it's a very closed system and if you don't want to do it the way they do it you will never be able to do it the way you want to do it everybody who has tried to break through into hollywood with a unique indian american european whatever style you want to fo- get into has had a difficulty you have to follow their rules of the game so uh, even shikhar kapoor after a couple of films he he uh, he didn't stay on in hollywood he's working in uh, bombay film industry now very close friend of mine ashok amrit raj has made 115 films in hollywood but they are just 115 hollywood style films they are not the kind of films that you and i would watch in indian cinema they are just hollywood it is it's like a factory they is producing product and they'll continue to make that product for their audiences and they make so much money from that audience that they don't don't really care about what happens outside that system so it's sort of a hollywood always has been like america is a very insular place you join it and then you stay there and if you bring something unique to the place it's unlikely to you know gel unless it falls in line with what they want can you imagine film sent from india made by gurudat bimal roy didn't win the best oscar for the best film i mean it, it's a joke of course satyajit ray got recognition globally and eventually an oscar also and this is getting a little long because you moved into the oscar thing that could be a talk by itself but i must tell you this satyajit ray won the lifetime achievement oscar at car at uh, uh the academy now how did that happen the year before they had given an award to akira kurosawa who was incidentally a friend of satyajit ray 
And on Satyajit Rai's invitation, Akira Kurosawa came to India in 1975-76 at the International Film Festival of India. And they, they traveled together to see the Taj Mahal. So yeah, whole military delegation was there. Correct. So you know yeah. this was this was this was a very uh, um, nice uh, thing. We were not around. Obviously, we would have had the pleasure of seeing these two great filmmakers. Uh, so the next year they had to give an international film award. The Academy met, and there were some requests. But Martin Scorsese was promoting Satyajit Rai at the Academy, but the Academy filmmakers were not that convinced as yet. They didn't even know who this guy was. So they, they were still, you know, the governors and the people, they're still living in Los Angeles and they had no idea of global cinema as such. So Norman Jusen from Canada got up sure. and he gave a long talk on the importance of Satyajit Rai to world cinema. And immediately the governors and the academy members decided that is the man we have to give the award to. And the problem was that Satyajit Rai fell extremely sick and he was hospitalized. So there was no possibility of him getting on a plane. His doctors refused to get to America and enter the Oscars, walk there and pick up the award. So the Academy was left with no other option but to send the Oscar to him. And for the first time in the history of the Academy, Oscar was not given at the function itself, but was sent by plane to another country, to another filmmaker, and he received it in Calcutta. So when the Oscar came to Calcutta, Kolkata now, and he was in a nursing home, he was not even informed that it has come because he was not well. But later on, when he was told, he said, okay, what do they want? This, they wanted a recorded speech. And he accepted the Oscar on the hospital bed and gave a speech. It's, it's, a, it's a unique event by itself because uh, in that speech, he mentioned that... Um, he had written to Billy Wilder after watching Double Indemnity in the 50s and he wrote a long eight page letter, never received a reply. And uh, Billy Wilder was still alive and he got to hear that. And he sent a telegram to Kolkata to Satyajit Rai that please come over now. I'm sorry about not replying back then, but you are my guest. I will pay for your trip and you come here and we will talk cinema. Obviously, you know, didn't happen. Satyajit Rai passed away two months later. But he remained and remains the only filmmaker from India to have not only won the top honors in Khan, whatever way, you know, uh, Khan honored him in 1982 and then earlier on gave him Patar Panchali the prize. And he won the prizes in um, Berlin and in Venice and, of course, the Oscar. And when Derek Malcolm asked him, where are the awards that you have won? I can't see any of them in your study. He said, well, I keep them. But Derek Malcolm was so insistent that he wanted to see those awards that he pushed Satyajit Rai to show him. So he took him to his bedroom and from underneath his bed pulled out a trunk which had all the awards he had won from Venice, from Berlin, from Cannes and, and all these other awards. He had not won the Oscar till then, but eventually he did. So he, he had won every major award on earth and they were all stored in a sort of trunk under his bed. He didn't show them in a showcase. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Lal, for such a scintillating talk. Uh, now we'll take up audience questions. There are a lot of questions now. The first question is from uh, Ashwin, Ashwani Gambhir. He says, in India, why we have very few or maybe uh, not any academic institute specialization on business of filmmaking and film festivals? Maybe MBA, media and entertainment started in some Indian institute, but their syllabus is like general MBA. Yeah. Actually, this is this is this is a very difficult business, uh, primarily because it requires passion for cinema. And if you do a specific MBA just in filmmaking or film uh, festivals, you're likely to be limited by choice. People prefer to have a more generalized study program in which they can specialize in finance or management or marketing and other aspects of uh, running a company uh, rather than just specific area. I think if you are um, uh, interested in uh, filmmaking as a business career or want to study further, you should just do a proper director's or producer's course. 
anywhere in the world or in India. There are some institutes in India. And rather than MBA, I'm not too much of a, you know, I don't favor MBAs in businesses of creativity. They take away the creativity out of the business. You see, similarly, you know, the, the government administration, it takes away the creativity out of anything. These are very difficult businesses for normal people to understand because emotions are involved. People to people contacts are involved. They are not cut and dry businesses. They are not like flying an airline or setting up post offices around the country or, you know, making an electronic component that can sell across the world. This is cinema. It is art. You have to have a passion for it or you don't have it. You can't you can't bring MBA style functioning in this and should not. It will not help. It doesn't help. It has never worked. Whoever has tried to do it, it's become a sort of formula. And then it's not the same thing. It limits the creativity of people. Absolutely. The second question is from Siddiq Azad. He says, uh, once Indian filmmakers were very much inspired by the Soviet filmmakers, uh, especially Eisenstein's Montadis yes. were very yes. much reflected in Indian cinema. But now in Bollywood films, Soviet Montadis are missing. What are the reasons uh, of changing the track of Bollywood cinema now? Look, I don't like the word Bollywood. Okay, because it makes us sound like we are some inferior kind of Hollywood people. Asa kuch nahi hai. We, we, we are as good as anybody else. So there is no such thing as Bollywood. And uh, I have had the unfortunate experience of hearing at film festivals, you know, people talk about Bollywood and how Bollywood is coming. Around. There is no such thing. Adur Gopal Krishan, Manal Sen, Gautam Ghosh are not Bollywood. There is no such yeah. thing as Bollywood. Okay. Indian cinema has a unique place. Now, Soviet montage. Soviet montage, Battleship Pachimkin and Eisenstein's works inspired people who watched those films at that time and went to film schools. People like us who went to film schools, they watched this and we liked it and we saw how it works. In fact, some of those classic scenes have been duplicated many times over, not only in Indian cinema, commercial cinema, as well as, uh, you know, American cinema also. The scene of the Odessa steps, which is mm. possibly one of the best scenes ever created in cinema, Absolutely. works so beautifully, was utilized by Brian De Palm in Untouchables. You can see the same thing with yeah. the with the with the baby in the pram going and the camera placements. So those montages are a style of telling a film story. We used similar montages in a different way. You know, in, in the popular Indian cinema, there is this unique thing for many years I, funny the Indian girl and the boy they're dancing in a song and every 15 seconds they will change their costume that that's 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 an Indian montage <laughs> it cannot happen in real life you can't change 15 costumes in 10 minutes but it happens in a song many times over so we have different ways of telling the story and the more they get exposed to that classic cinema style so we have one this. more question from Ashwini Gambhir he says uh, our lead, uh, we talked about. So, we have another question uh, from Ashwini Gambhir. He says, uh, uh, We talk about the basic root cinema is, is still not totally accepted as academics uh, by UGC in India. So, it's like a policy matter basically, except FTI have AICT approval for degree courses. Uh, what is your view on education of, of cinema in India? The faster they do it, the better it will be for this country. Language of cinema is similar to literature. So if you teach English literature, if you teach Urdu literature, if you teach Sanskrit literature, if you teach any language, you should also teach cinema language. In fact, cinema is a global language. The language that you speak, like I'm speaking in English, limitation. But cinema ka jo language, hai, jo cinema ki image or sound ki storytelling ka style. Hai, yeah, non-fiction may style hai. Ye ek ki hai. It will take a long time for our government officials to understand that they are missing out on one of the greatest asset of our civilization. Everybody around the world understands that despite Hollywood being the craze globally, Indian cinema has its own star system. Absolutely. And I have seen it with my own eyes. Ek aapko anecdote deta 
I had the unique pleasure of bringing Will Smith to a golf club in Delhi. And nobody knew who Will Smith was. Even in a golf club. I had great difficulty getting him to play golf there. And he was shocked. He said, I am a Hollywood star and nobody understands. And, and, and luckily, there were some Japanese tourists playing golf. They understood who he was and they crowded around him. But nobody mobbed him, nothing. Try taking Shah Rukh Khan to a golf club in Delhi. Try taking Amitabh Bachchan to a golf club here. It will it'll, it'll be very difficult to manage with the security. We are crazy about our own stars. This is, this, is, this is what makes our cinema so unique and alive. So, this is what the government will come to understand that this is a cinema is a soft power. This can be a global export. This is very important to study in colleges, very important in schools. In fact, I believe 10th onwards you should have a course in cinema like you have legal studies in 11th and 12th, like you have home science, you have um, other subjects now, computer science. You have so many other subjects rather than just physics, chemistry and maths to choose from. Cinema studies should be introduced at that level. Mm -hmm. Very true. important. True. true that. So we have another question uh, from Miraj Ahmad. He says, I have heard uh, there is a big lobbying at film festivals to showcase the films. Is it right? Some film festivals may be, but uh, the international film festivals are so worried about their reputation, they don't have any lobbies. So I don't think Toronto, Cannes, Venice, they have any lobbies as such. They choose what they get and they try to actually compete with each other. So if Locarno is getting something, Cannes will try to get it before that. You know, that sort of competition. So the lobby system doesn't work. But uh, there is, of course, a lot of lobbying in winning the Oscars. No question about it. A lot of people spend money just to have parties and encourage uh, voters to vote in a certain way for the Oscars. I've seen it myself. So th that, that's a different thing. True. Uh, see, we have another question from Ashwin Gambhir. He says, is any expectation of world-class film festival jury from India? I didn't understand. Is there any expectation of world-class film jury from India? What, what, can, can he just um, uh, ask again? What does he mean? I believe he's asking, you know, uh, normally he's trying to ask that, you know, the, the people from Indian cinema are not the part of jury abroad. So what are they saying? No, 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 jury. Pe. Bahut log busy bhi hote hai, they can't make it sometimes. But Cannes Film Festival, mein Shekhar Kapoor has been on the jury. Nandita Das has been on the jury. Ashwarya Rai has been on the jury. Other festivals, Yash Chopra was on the jury at Berlin. You know, people go. Uh, it's just a question of how you go about it. And yes. a lot of filmmakers are invited for this. Uh, so India's well-represented juries. It's not as well as represented in the awards nowadays. But uh, juries are True. 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 So another question is from Abdullah Rayan. He says, uh, in India, so many film festivals are being organized. And it's good. And film festivals are the best place to showcase the talent for budding filmmakers. But don't you think in the same line, we also need more finance agencies like NRDC to help new and young filmmakers. Uh, uh, my, my, I have some um, uh, very strong views on this. If the festival attend Karna so you should attend as many festivals as you can. No problem. India may bore. But NFDC making films is not the right way because then what happens? The government officials get involved and your vision gets curtailed. There is enough market today to go out and make a film. It's not so expensive to make a short film. There is so much outside the system. And I have myself seen Indian filmmakers raise money from overseas uh, distributors and producers and get product made. So they, they, restricting yourself to NFDC is OK. Fine, it's, it's another institution. It makes films. And it has made some wonderful films in the past. But that's not, not the right way to make uh, you know, um, a film in the uh, present context when there is OTT platforms and there is so much happening. Uh, for people who, who think NFDC is the way, they, they will realize so sooner than later the other factors involving passing of the script, getting the film made, and then dealing with government bureaucracy. That restricts you as a filmmaker. It makes you, makes you into a different person. But I, you should be, you know, away from all this. Just, just focus on getting the best performance on on um, on film and on screen it's 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 
it just uh, you know is not conducive to optimizing yourself as a filmmaker True. nfdc has uh, recently restarted its production and you can apply there if you want but try making it outside the system so this one more question from ashwini gambhir he says what the main difference uh, at the organization exposure part of if we go and can the main difference is one by knows the inside story but the uh, main difference is that can has very little little involvement in management of the festival from government side it's not owned by any ministry as such and it has uh, evolved over a period of time uh because the government is involved in goa you keep changing the people who run it last many many years you have had many directors there is no artistic director there is um, there is all kinds of whims and fancies of the political heads from various times there are all kinds of other involvements there are too many interferences and um, uh, that's that's the difference khan khan is uh, a privately run organization and uh, before uh, terry frumo they had gil jacob and of course christian juan now running the india side and the global side these people know the filmmakers around the world on a one on one basis so they can pick up the phone and get woody allen to show his film or martin scorsese to be on the jury or steven spielberg to come now a person who works in the indian film festival situation is maximum there for 3 years so how many people can he get to know personally in 3 years it takes 30 years to just to get to know somebody and it's very difficult because the people in the film business are so uh, such uh, so um, you know self uh, they live in a self imposed exile in a way they live in their own world they don't meet too many people they just make films and they rarely speak to people outside so to break into that system to get to know people regularly to meet them around the world it will take a decade just before you exchange visiting cards with five important people and uh, uh, to invite them to come to india to attend the festival to bring their films is is going to be even longer and it's it's becoming increasingly difficult to travel nowadays you know because people are so involved in film making they can't take five day breaks six day breaks and go out there unless they're retired or they're starting out uh, you know uh, anybody in the in, in their prime but all of them will make an exception for khan because one they know the guys who are running the festival personally to the prestige and also the prestige attached to the festival that if you are in khan you are of consequence so that's that's uh, the reason khan is uh, different from everything that we do so we have i think last question now uh, uh, from mr omar azmi he says uh, uh, a question regarding oscars like there is a lot of practical leverage as to how a film performs in front of academy number one as much as i love bong joon ho's work i still believe parasite this year was very much driven by a political stance it took against north korea just a personal opinion A Joker was a much better film than Parasite. Number two, does that uh, culture also replicate among uh, different big film festivals like Cannes or Berlin? Of course, it does. The jury in Cannes, uh, you know, gave the top prize to um, a documentary by Michael Moore. It was against George Bush. Now, the timing of that in that particular year at that particular month. Quentin Tarantino was on the jury, and he forced the jury to sort of uh, think that way. Uh, made a lot of sense because everybody in the world wanted to make a political statement against what America was doing. Uh, today, if you see it in the larger context, that film was not the best film and shouldn't have been given the top prize. So, political considerations come because of other factors. Uh, I don't know about Parasite, North Korea, and Joker being the best film of the year. that's 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 also uh, you know uh, probably not the case but uh, there are other films there was a film um, made by um, uh, a dark knight a uh, couple of years ago almost uh, 10 years ago over 10 years ago and dark knight was considered the best film hollywood had made it didn't even compete in the top 10 of top 5 films it didn't even get to that stage and um, the filmmaker 
of Dark Knight, Chris Nolan is considered no. the best filmmaker in the world. Even now, what he makes is outstanding, extraordinary. And Dark Knight was a Hollywood proper film with uh, the, the sort of Chris Nolan touch to it. I loved it. The film that won and swept the Oscars that year was Slumdog Millennia. And there was no connect. Because if you look at Dark Knight, you're watching pure cinema. It is, it is at some other level, you know, and uh, it didn't even compete. So, of course, you know, there are, there are other factors in the minds of people which impact people. And uh, uh, Slumdog Millennia, you can't watch for more than once, you know. It's, it's, a, it's a great film. You can watch it once and that's it. But Dark Knight, you can learn so much. The Heath Ledger's acting in there in, um, uh, I think, Dark Knight was far superior to what uh, happened in Joker. Uh, but it's fine. It's a personal opinion. And uh, those things those things matter at some level, certainly. I believe now we have the last question of the session today uh, okay. from Saurabh Goyal. Uh, he says, yes, sir, we can see some of the prominent and the most accessible film markets focused on low-budget indie films, documentaries, etc. That may help raise funds pre and post productions. I think very important you, question. Yeah, very important. It's it's very uh, it's a good question. The two festivals that you can attend in this regard, one of course is the Film Bazaar in Goa, managed by the NFDC. It is essentially a mix of people who make films overseas and India. And just to get there and get the experience of that is an important factor. And you will get to meet people who are investing in films and you will meet independent filmmakers. You will meet a lot of foreigners. So your networking will improve. And the other thing that I would suggest uh, is, is uh, if you if you can um, just specifically, um, you know, uh, find a way to do it uh, is a little more expensive is to attend any of the European film festivals. You will meet a lot of people in the in Berlin. Definitely the film market over there is very important. Con very expensive, but uh, more expensive than Berlin to attend for an independent filmmaker. But again, a good market. So th those are the places to go to. Uh, for documentary filmmakers, uh, Film Bazaar would be a starting point. The one in Bombay, the MIF, that's coming up very well. I don't know if you can make money over there or get people to invest in your films, but you can at least meet a lot of documentary filmmakers. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lal. So with this, uh, this session comes to an end. And Thank I'm really thankful for thank you joining us today uh, for this wonderful talk. Uh, I think this will remain with our audience for long, for a long time, and it will be part of our archive. Also, they can watch in future as well. So I thank you once again for joining us today in this session. Uh, absolute honor and privilege having you on the show today. Thank you, thank you, so thank you to all, all the people at IMC. Thank you very much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks so much. So tomorrow we'll be back uh, at uh, uh, 3 o'clock. Tomorrow's show is at 3 o'clock, uh, 3 p.m. basically. Uh, 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 one French actress will be joining tomorrow at 3 p.m. Uh, in this uh, series tomorrow. Uh, so till then, uh, goodbye, good day. Uh, stay home, stay safe. Thank you so much once again. Thank you so much for joining us today.